when you look at the news that's out there right now, and then we have to get into you know what's happening economically, we look at the headlines right now. Toronto, Vancouver are driving the headlines. I mean, it's like the housing market is melting down when in fact it's the condo market in Toronto that's really driving the major headlines. And we've got a slide in just just how dramatic that turn that downturn is in the condo market. I think it's the worst in 25, 30 years, somewhere in between all of that. When you look at GTA new condo sales, nobody's buying them. These are the 450 square foot kind of shoe boxes that everybody has to get out of. They bought them, they paid too much. They had no intention of owning them or holding them. They maybe intended to rent them out. Most did not, they intended to flip them. Well, of course we know that story. The music stopped, there's no chairs left. All of a sudden, the market is flooded with these, and we're just at the tip of the iceberg. It's going to get far worse before it gets better. Let, let's dig into this, Patrick, because this is, to me, uh, like, you know me. I'm not a big condo guy. I'm not a big fan of condos. Um, they don't fit my tactic. They don't fit my strategy. They don't fit where I'm going with my real estate portfolio. But for some people, they're very good. And, and for some people, they really want condos, and they really like condos. And if you have a 5-year, 10-year, 15-year outlook, and condos fit into your tactic, condos fit into your real estate game plan, you should definitely be looking at condos right now because you're going to get the best possible deal. It's not time to be looking at condos two years ago when they're selling off the shelf like crazy. And it's certainly not going to be the time in two, three years from now when they go back to that. The condo market is going to one day recover. There's no doubt. And if you're if you have a long enough timeline, this is the time when you should be investigating this stuff, Patrick. And it just seems very counterintuitive, but that's the truth of how you get successful in real estate, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And listen, there is lots of deals out there. Personally, I'm not interested in that market. I think that somebody who's maybe very savvy, got deep pockets, maybe they want to park some cash in downtown Toronto or Vancouver because they see a future state and they're just really parking cash. That's the play. If you've got to get in there and get cash flow and you're expecting all these returns on investment, I think you better have the wherewithal to grab that property, probably even pay cash for it and just park capital in the real estate, which was always a big thing in both Toronto and Vancouver, particularly Vancouver. Of course, those were the headlines of foreign investors doing that, where you'd find buildings that were literally 60 percent empty, like 40 percent occupancy. The rest was just empty units hanging out there. Anyways, long story. We see that condo market. That's a lot of what's driving the headlines. Then we look at the real estate market overall. And this goes back, we've been talking about it every single episode. We keep talking about single family. In other words, five units or less when I'm talking single family. They're not building enough of that. But JG, let's get into the, uh, you got that slide of dwellings under construction. So when we look at what's happening in the purpose built, now here's the discussion. What drives a market? Is it low interest rates or is it demand? You know, and this is kind of a, philosophical conversation because when you look at demand overall for housing off the charts we need places for people to live yet single family not being built we see the condo market of course turning down as it went up in you know like it went through the stratosphere and now what we're, what are we seeing we're seeing purpose built and that is because of CMHC's uh whatever they call it, MLI select financing, right? And so guess what? People are chasing that particular property type because the math works. And so we know there's demand on both sides, but what's being built? Well, what, but that, that, your question is what drives real estate demand or interest rates? And the answer is, is interest rates drive demand. And ultimately, it's a demand. This is a supply and demand game. But the interest rate drive demand. And I'm telling you what's going to happen right now is, is, and we've seen it, is, you know, they've piled a ton of money and, and time and effort into this MLI Select program. A lot of investors are going there. And, uh, and that's going to shift too one day. They're, they're going to start, you know, and you're already seeing it right now where the banks are getting hungrier and hungrier for mortgages. Don't eat me, don't eat me, don't eat me. We've got some great stats on that that I think you'll share after because approvals, mortgage approvals are like at an all time low right now. And that's not good for banks. The banks don't make money if they're not lending money. So you are already starting to see, and I had a call this week, actually, sorry, uh, last week, last Friday. And here was the conversation, Patrick, and you're going to start seeing this more. It's a tip of the iceberg. The guy says to me, hey, JG, I want to get uh, 
I want you. I want Vistra to take over my entire portfolio. I want you guys to manage the whole thing. He's been managing it himself for ten years. He says, I, I'm just, uh, I'm going in new places in my career. I want Vistra to take it all for me. And I said, wonderful. We've talked about this before, you and I. What, what changed your mind? How come now, all of a sudden, like right now, you're calling me? He, he said this. He says, interest, my interest rates just renew, and they came in lower than expected. Therefore, I now have the room for cash flow, and I have the room to, to give the management to Vistra Property Group. And I think that that Patrick illustrates the very point of how interest rates drive demand. That's why they're an influencer. But ultimately, as time goes on, they really do become the driver and people will make decisions. And it will be the same with the rest of the asset classes, including single family. Um, that's my thoughts. Well, the thing about it is that when we look at it from an investment point of view, you know, single family is still a really, really attractive buy if you can get in. The point of it is, is that they're not building any. They're right now it's flat. It's actually declining. Yet the demand continues to escalate. Even if they turned on the tap tomorrow, they would be years before they get caught up to meet the demand in that particular asset class or that particular property type. The other side of that coin is that when we look at the listings, the number of listings overall right across the country, by the way, is actually increasing. But Buyers are sitting on the sidelines. They're going, no, I'm going to wait for the rates to come down. So there's a real mismatch of sellers are actually getting on the market, trying to put stuff out there. They don't want to come on their price unless they're really motivated. Like if you own condos, they want to get the hell out of them. The buyers, on the other hand, are going, yeah, I'm not too excited yet. I think interest rates are going to come down a little bit more. If your price doesn't come down and you know, I'm not willing to buy. So it's a, a little bit of a standoff right now in terms of some property types. And then ultimately, some of the concerns economically is that, you know, when you start to see a slowdown in housing, although we haven't seen it quite yet, but we know it's coming down the pipe, there's lag, we're going to see those construction jobs start to really, uh, the unemployment continue to rise in that area, by the way, they already are. Short of Alberta, that's the anomaly right across the country is Alberta is a standalone in that world. And then ultimately, uh, we look at that particular slowdown because people are not spending money. They're not in the housing market. Deals don't pencil. So contractors are not building. And that's going to start to slow things down. So when you look into the future, we see that slowdown happening. And this is where the banks come in. So that's kind of the preface into the conversation about interest rates. Because banks are not lending money. There's two parts to it. Number one, people aren't stepping up to borrow. And number two is they're risk mitigating. They're covering their asses, So they're not as quick to finance deals. They're tightening up in some areas. And so it really is an interesting time when it comes to the market overall. Let's dig into that, Patrick. Actually, you asked a good question. So so what is what do you think is the... Do you think it's people not stepping up to borrow? Or do you think it is the banks not willing to lend? I think it's a combination of both based on which, what I'm seeing. Major driver. Well, I think there's it's a combination of both. I mean, keep in mind as OSFI has hit the banks, I think three times with up your reserves, up your reserves. So in other words, OSFI slash the, the, the banking system overall is seeing risk. Some of the banks are carrying a lot of mortgages on their books and they're nervous because we are starting to see a couple things. Number one, consumer uh, insolvency. So that's happening. Business insolvencies are happening. So they're seeing that market. So they're tightening up their lending a little bit, especially, by the way, when it comes to investors. They're wanting to really mitigate their risks as well. So it's a combination of both and people going, no, I can't afford this. I can't afford this. I, you know, I cannot make the math work. So that's the challenge. And that's what Bank of Canada is facing. Now, I think, Patrick, Okay, I hear you, and that's fine. That, that was a very uh, Justin Trudeau kind of answer there. Thanks for that. But but let's, <laughs> I haven't I haven't uh, I haven't poked you on the political side in a while, so I feel like I got to bring that into the yeah. Okay. We got the soap opera there south of the border, and we'll talk about that later. But here's my question for you. I think I think people do want to borrow. I think there is a some pent up demand out there in the market um, for the, for the certain asset class. I think they can't borrow because of OSFI, because of the qualifying rate, because of also interest rates. Um, and I think that is the majority. And I, I'll say the majority as in like maybe 
this is, you know, anecdotal. This is like, I would say that 60, 60 to 70 percent of the reason why the market isn't moving more so than the demand. I think the demand is there. People want to get the people want to buy a home, but they still they, they want to buy a home. They want to get into a single family. They want to stop renting. That continues to, to drive that 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 need is still there, but they can't. They literally can't. And I, you know how I know that? Because I see it on the rental side of the market. They come to us and they're phenomenally qualified renters and they should buy a house, but they can't. And they want to, but they can't. Denied. Well, yeah, and I get all of that, but there's also consumer debt as part of your renters who they can't qualify because they're also carrying a lot of consumer debt. But I'm going to give you something that a lot of people are stepping over this, I think. And that's this. So as you know, we were on vacation. We were at a wedding in Hawaii and uh, we're hanging out in Hawaii. We stay at the Four Seasons. Now, Four Seasons is a pretty high end hotel, but I'm looking at it. It's packed. Like, gosh, what? who's talking about an economy that's bad, right? Then I go, I'm in Toronto. I go to the expand event with Alfonso and uh, I meet some friends over at the Fairmont, uh, York Hotel downtown. It's freaking packed, middle of the afternoon. I'm going, who, what economy is bad? Here's the thing. We step over one fundamental thing. If you live in a world where you can go to the Fairmont, you can go to uh, the Four Seasons, you can, uh, you know, go look at a Ferrari, whatever. It's like, there's no challenge with the economy at all. But that's the top, let's say 30% of the economy or the, the, of the demographic, if you will. When you get into those individuals that, hope to be able to, or should be able to, or believe they should be able to afford a home. For example, look at the service industry. Nobody in the service industry is buying a house. Now, maybe some would argue they never have, but I would say there has been some place for that. Then you get into, let's say, a supervisory position. So you get into that $100,000 a year, $80,000 a year position. Oh, well, maybe, no, there's no chance in hell. So the point is, is that when we look at it, if you live in a world where uh, you know, going for lunch at the Fairmont is a place that you would go. There seems to be no economic downturn. Get outside of that world, and it's a different world, JG. And I think that we're, we're, we would be remiss not to shine a light on the fact that 60% of the market has turned into a renter's market. That's my thought process on it. Well, and, and I, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and there's no doubt for sure uh, you know, there's different parts of the market. There's no doubt, but there's a good chunk of the market, and and I don't know the percent, but there's a good chunk of the market that wants to buy, uh, but they just can't right now. The banks, OSFI, have made it impossible for them to buy, and and the reason, Patrick, is I know they can afford it because their rent, the rent they're paying us, which they easily pay, because we only rent to people if they're income is if their rent is only 35 to 40 percent of their of their household income then we'll rent to them if it's above that we won't rent to them so my point is is that if they can afford a rent of twenty five hundred dollars they can easily buy a place and have a mortgage of two thousand or twenty five hundred dollars it's a no-brainer um but they can't they can't qualify that's the problem is that the, the banks will not qualify them and that's this part of the issue and i think that i hope in the next i don't know few months i hope that as interest rates come down this is the this is the market that becomes available to purchase and then we'll see where the market goes from there well and just for a shameless plug for the self-funding house initiative that we've got if those same individuals that can afford 2500 bucks a month for rent actually got a suite unit an adu of some sort then actually plan to invest in their home and have that tenant guess what they would in fact uh, qualify for that mortgage. That's the self-funding house initiative that we've got going on because that's just what it's going to be going forward, JG. I think that ultimately the affordability issue is not going to go away and you have to look at buying a home that's outside the traditional scope of maybe what you learned from your boober parents or whatever the case may be. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, definitely a self-funding house. I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan. And in fact, Patrick, this is why another shameless plug on the coach tour, you and I are doing a coach home tour we're doing an investor tour. You won't be there. I'll be there in Peterborough. So people should definitely uh, come and get registered for that. We'll put all the links in the show notes for everybody. But this is why, Patrick, because all of these 
whether it's a self-funding house where you put an ARU in the basement or it's a coach home initiative where you have an ARU in the basement and you add a coach home, all of these properties, these single family properties are great cash flow generators, but they also become very attractive to one big segment of the market, which is the one I'm counting on to exit my portfolio in good time, which is the multi-generational uh, sector of the market, Patrick. And you guys there in BC, right around your neck of the woods where you live, I mean, you see that every single day and I see it coming through the entire market and those multi-generational households, they will look for these kinds of properties where there could be some division, but they're all still together, but they all have their own space. I think it's going to be a huge deal in the next 5, 10, 15 years for people. At, so the, the property values of these things is definitely going to accelerate the rest of the market in terms of asset type. I think there's a couple of things that, you know, when I look at it and we don't get this message out enough, I, well, maybe we do, but the point of it is that when we look at real estate as an asset class, as a store of value, we look at the headwinds we face from mortgage rates or the bank lending or not lending. These are all short-term blips in the market. If we look at real estate and we say, I want to be able to, when you look at the global macro and you look at the devaluation of the dollar, you have to get your cash into hard assets. Real estate needs to be that asset. Then you look back and you say, well, how can I do that? Then you start to adjust the strategy. And whether that be a multifamily deal or a uh, self-funding house opportunity or generational uh, living, whatever that might be, get capital into the real estate market, which means changing your strategy, given what's going on economically. And I think that when we look at what's happening economically in Canada, when we look at what's happening in North America overall, and we look at the headwinds, we have to get our money to work in real estate. It's still a it's still the, a place to put your cash when it comes to uh, creating that store value. And we can't leave our money in the bank. We need to leverage that capital because well-positioned leverage makes sense even in this market. It's just not easy. Uh, no, nobody said it was ever going to be easy. Uh, it's really not easy to uh, to make millions of dollars. It takes effort, so you're going to have to work for it. <laughs> now, Patrick, I was just, while we were chatting, I was pulling up a little, uh, doing some research quickly on the profit margins of the big banks in the last couple of years because a lot of people assume that, banks are going to make a, a, a whack load of dough because interest rates are, are higher and there's definitely some truth to that but when they when when you look at this chart here and i'm going to put it up on the screen right now when you look at this chart here of mortgage approvals total approvals how much has gone down from 20 to 19 2020 2021 2020 you know look at 2022 i mean look how low this is Patrick, this is going to hit the banks because they are not putting their money to work. And I did some quick research and just about every single bank, their P&L is down by 50% or more because they can't put that money to work. And even though interest rates are higher, yes, they can't lend as much and it won't be long that they'll start squawking. I'll tell you that they got to get that money to work. And that's going to be a good thing for us investors. The lowest it's been. So think about this, JG. The lowest uh, mortgage approvals since 2002 is what I read in this particular chart. And so 20 plus years, right? When the demand is at the highest, our population growth has been like 2 million over the past couple of years. So you've got banks not lending, houses not being built, immigration continuing to be really strong, and banks aren't lending. Hmm. Crazy, like it's crazy, uh, like, and and I'm seeing this already. And look, I'll show you this. I, I sent you this the other day, but BMO sent me this message because I, I do some banking with BMO. I think I do banking with all the banks, but I do some with BMO, and they sent me this asking for me to switch my mortgages to them, and they're offering forty one hundred dollars per mortgage here, Patrick. This adds up to, a, and this is because they got a ton of money on their balance sheet. And they have nowhere to put it because they can't get people approved. And these, the five top banks, and I'll, I'll, I'll rattle this off for you right now, but the top banks, RBC, profit in 2023, $16 billion. They're shooting in 2024. Right now, they're trending for $8 billion. That's a 50% haircut. Still $8 billion of profit, but it's a 50% haircut. They won't like that. TV, down from $14 billion to $4 billion. 
Scotia Bank, 10.5 billion to 3.2 billion. BMO, 11.4 to 3 billion. CIBC, 8.2 billion to 3.3 billion. They are all taking heavy haircuts on their uh, on their profit, and their mortgage lending is a big reason for that. Well, you know, and and yes, mortgage lending, lending overall, because what the stats are showing, and I know we don't have a chart for it, but I know is that what's happening is people overall are just pulling back. They're spending less and less money. And other than Alberta, we know that retail sales are down dramatically and that's starting to add up. So businesses are also struggling. So economically, the headwinds are getting stronger, not lighter. And as much as interest rates are probably going to come down when we're shooting this, uh, we don't know where interest rates are. What do you think? Make, make a Patrick prediction right now, right here. Uh, well, I yeah, I think they'll come down a quarter point. That's what's built into the system already. Uh, that's what the market is anticipating. It's not going to really change much because it's already built in. We're seeing it even in bond yields are down a bit. I think I'm going to shoot. You know me, I, I, I like to be wrong. Uh, but I like to shoot optimistically, Patrick. So I'm going to go half a point. They're going to drop a half a point, 50 basis points they're dropping tomorrow. Uh, they know they're in trouble and they got to get things spurred up and they know it's going to take time. So as a result, they're going half a point down tomorrow. We'll see. We'll see who's right. It would be interesting to see what they do. I mean, we're talking about real estate here, but I look at business insolvencies and business insolvencies are up dramatically as are consumer insolvencies. And so when businesses are... Uh, in that position, number one, they're not hiring, they're not buying uh, inventory. So economically, things are slowing down. Will the Bank of Canada look into the future aside, by the way, uh, from real estate and say, okay, we have to look at business and what's happening with businesses. They are slowing down. Not, not every business is going insolvent, but the point is, is that they're up spiked dramatically, number one. Number two, businesses that are still okay are slowing down. In other words, they're not spending as much money. They're not borrowing money for inventory and the consumer is not buying as much. So things are really slowing down. Given the lag, will the Bank of Canada be smart enough to look into the future and go, are we going to wait for this to break before we react or are we actually going to react? I'm still in the camp that uh, I'm starting to think more and more it's going to be a hard landing. I hope it's not, but I think we're in for more things. Yeah, interesting. I, I think, Patrick, uh, and, and here's, you know, I know right now of several big builders where they have building permit in hand, okay? They've had the building permits in hand for several months now. They are not starting any projects until next spring because, because of the interest rates. And I think that, you know, you and I, and, you know, I'm the biggest proponent of, of like how the cities and the municipalities are getting in the way of development. I mean, I see it every single day, but I got to say more and more, you got a lot of people with building permits in hands. You got people with, with like ready to go. And they're saying, you know what, we're just going to wait until, and there's a lot of delay. That's what I mean about the, the pent up demand, Patrick, where there's a lot of people sitting on their hands, as you pointed out. And at some point, and I think that's what the Bank of Canada is really trying to assess is they're trying to assess like, they know that the minute they start dropping rates, some of this demand is going to be let loose. And if it's too much too quick, we're going to, they're, going to, they're afraid they're going to be back into inflation. And, uh, and that's what we gotta, that's but, what their wait, problem is. But here's the reality. The reality of it is, is inflation is literally when you take out uh, shelter costs, as in rent and the interest portion of a mortgage, your inflation is like easily 2%. So most of inflation right oh, now is made up of oh, the interest portion of the mortgage and shelter costs as in rent. Yeah, no, I 100% uh, 100% on board with you, which is why I think it makes sense for them. And, uh, and Bank of Canada, if you're watching this, we know that you watch this <laughs> show before you make decisions. We know you do. Um, uh, please drop it half a point, 50 basis points. That's what needs to happen. And uh, you're going to start spurring up some of these single family, like the developer I'm talking about, Patrick, all single family. This and I'm, I'm I'm talking about in Peterborough, not a big market. I'm talking about hundreds of builds that are on pause. The minute those interest rates start to come down, that builder's going to start building again. Yeah, well, we're going to find out uh, if they come down. And if Bank Again is watching, Tiff, you're fired. Uh, Carolyn Rogers, step in and take over. <laughs> now you sound like Donald Trump, Patrick. Now you sound <laughs> like Donald Trump. <laughs> If you like what you learned here, go to the description below and subscribe for our free insider's newsletter where you can 
Also stay up to date for our upcoming events and our courses.